Buenos dias, que pasa mi familia? How's everybody doing? Second service. You guys totally rock. Who's awake this morning? <laughs> Woo! So this is part five of this series. And yes, I've had coffee. It's free. You can have all you want. I'm just saying, you can have all you want. No, this has been a great series. If you haven't um, been able to jump in on any of these parts, uh, I want to encourage you. This has been one of the coolest um, series how do you say that? Series? Series is. You don't say series is. You just, there's just an apostrophe there. Thing. You just say series. Like Jesus' name. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I had to clarify that. I just, um. So this has been one of the coolest series that we've done because uh, it's been very meaningful to Misty and I because it all stems from something very supernatural, significant that God uh, spoke to our hearts years ago, like nine years ago. God said that the year I would turn 42... He was going to do something crazy, awesome, significant. And here I am, 42 years old, and this has been a year. I'm just telling you right now, it's been crazy. It's been, uh, it's been a whirlwind. But if you've missed any of these services, go, you've got to go back to get caught up because we don't have time to go into it all. But miracle after miracle after miracle of God speaking to us and showing us things that would happen this year uh, in the last nine years. And um, I just want to emphasize that God, so many times we say to ourselves, I just want to hear from God. I just wish I could hear what God was saying to me right now. Let me tell you, God is always speaking to you. He is, he is always talking to you about your life. The, the question is, are we listening? The question is, are we paying attention? Because oftentimes we allow ourselves to get so incredibly preoccupied. We, get, we allow ourselves to get so busy with the things of life that we we just don't have time to pay attention. We just don't have time to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us. And, and I just want to encourage you, just as God has unveiled so much about His purpose and His promise for this church supernaturally, He wants to do the same thing in you. And in fact, here's why you want to pay attention and take notes today. I'm just going to tell you right now. This is why you want to listen. Because our moment of arrival, which is what 42 sig- uh, signifies in Scripture... Okay, our moment of arrival. You, it's not just about our moment of arrival as a church, but it's about your moment of arrival as a person. It's, it's about God's purpose behind his promise for your life. God is constantly, I, I, I hope that you hear what I'm saying because I'm, I'm speaking right to your spirit if you'll only listen to me this morning. God is constantly pulling you towards his purpose, towards who he wants you to be, what he wants you to do, where he wants you to go, you are here for a reason, all right? You're here for a reason on this earth. And, and until you get that, I hope you're listening, because this will change you if you hear what I'm saying this morning. Until you get that, your life isn't going to make sense. I'm not, I'm not going to make you raise your hand right now, but raise your hand in your mind. If you would say right now, my life does not make sense, okay? The reason is because you're not connected to your purpose for being here. So this, this, today's message is going to be very powerful. It's going to be very um, enlightening as to your life, where God wants you to be, but also for us as a church, it's going to be so cool. So who's ready for the word of God? Amen. Yes. Amen. Well, today is part five. If you're taking notes, the title is simply this, the purpose behind the promise. Part five, the purpose behind the promise. We're going to dive into what that purpose is. But before we really get going on today's message, we want to just pause. We want to recognize and we want to pray for a family. Um, This week on August 6th, the community of Grove suffered a devastation as a 14-year-old young boy decided to end his life. He was getting ready to go into his freshman year. So the freshman class of Grove, which includes our two twin daughters, have all been very devastated. Uh, This is actually the second student in two years, which would have graduated with them, has decided that life wasn't worth living. And so we just want to pause and pray for the Chirac family and for the freshman class as we roll back into this school year. It's going to be a very difficult few days as they start off this year without a classmate that they sat next to, that they laughed with, that they had food fights with, that they loved. So will you pray with me for the Chirac family? Father God, we thank you. Lord, that even in these types of moments, God, even in the devastation and hurt and the pain that we deal with in this life, God, we know that there is a promise that you never leave us. You never forsake us. God, we pray right now that you would put your arms around the Chirac family. 
God, I pray for Nick's mom and dad. God, I pray for his siblings. God, I pray for the extended family. God, all of them that are so confused and hurt right now. God, I pray that they would run to you, God, with open arms. God, I pray that they would allow your peace and your comfort to surround them, even through the confusion. God, I pray for the class of the freshman class in Grove. God, I pray for these 14-year-olds, God, as they roll back into school. God, I pray that you would help them to know, God, that you've not forsaken them. God, I pray that those who know you would shine their light in the hallways, God, that they would realize that there are people that are hurting around them every day. God, I just pray right now, Jesus, that this church, God, would open their arms, God, and that we would be the light that you want us to be in this very, very dark world. God, let us let hope shine through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. If you think about it, pray for the school and the family continually in the next few weeks. Well, today, as we are diving into part five, we've been talking this whole series about the story of Nehemiah. This is an Old Testament story about a people group, the children of Israel, who had God had exiled out of their homeland. All right, their homeland was Jerusalem. God had exiled them into slavery because of their disobedience. They weren't there just a few years. They had been gone for 70 years serving the nation of Babylon because of their disobedience. Don't miss that, all right? God had a plan. He had a purpose. They completely veered off of what that plan was. And anytime we veer off of God's plan, there's consequences. And in this case, there was consequences for the entire nation. So God begins to bring back the people group after 70 years. He brings them back to the land of Jerusalem. And this was the arrival of his promise, all right? He had promised that after you are exiled, I'll bring you back and we will rebuild Jerusalem. That included the temple as well as the walls. So we've been talking about how the walls were rebuilt during this whole series. And the interesting thing is a lot of times we miss it. We focus on this incredible wall that was built in 52 days. It was 8 foot wide, 39 foot high, an impossible feat for any humanity to do on their own, all right? But at the same time, we look at this wall and we think to ourselves, like, that's incredible. But God wasn't just trying to rebuild a wall. Yes, it was going to bring physical protection, but God wanted to do something in the people through the process of building the wall. All right, I know I'm talking fast, but don't miss this. It was about the process of building the wall. God wanted to do a work in the people. What was that work? He wanted to bring change to their life. The purpose behind the promise has always been about life change. And that's what it was in that day as well as in our day today. Go with me to Nehemiah. We're going to turn in our word. I believe it's five if I could turn my page. Throw it up there for me, will you? There we go. Nehemiah 6, chapter 15 and 16. And it says this. So on October 2nd, the wall was finished. Say finished. I cannot wait until we get to say that around here. You pulled up this morning. If you're one of those people that are OCD, you like everything in line like I do, to drive into the chaotic mess that you see around our campus is like a little bit overwhelming, but at the same time, you have to realize this. The Bible says that God will peel back the windows of heaven and he will pour out a blessing so great upon you and upon us that we can't even contain it. So I want you, when you see the chaos outside and even in your own life, realize that it could very well be the blessings of God that are overflowing and overwhelming you, right? So be careful not to complain in the moment of God just pouring it out. So it was finished just 52 days after it had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. Pause. When our enemies and the surrounding nations, that means the enemy who wanted to take them out and everybody else around, when they heard about it, they were frightened because they realized what? The incredible power of God. And two, they were humiliated. Why? Because they did not believe it was even possible. They did not believe that they could actually do what they had done. It goes on to say this. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. This morning I want you to know something, and that is God loves to do the impossible. He loves to move into situations that seem completely impossible and are impossible without his help. You see, what he wanted to happen in that moment is he wanted the children of Israel to realize who he was and what he could do. He wanted the enemy to realize who he was, and what he could do. And he wanted every surrounding neighbor to realize who he was and what he could do. When he moved Brad and I here 
to this surrounding area. We always say we're, we're from Grove. But when people come to visit us, they say, where's Grove? We're like, well, it's actually that way. But that's like, you know, the closest town because God drops us out here. But you know what began to happen is when God drops us here and this collective group of people start coming from every single direction to this little place here, you know what begins to happen? God begins to move. Lives begin to get changed and people start to talk because people will come from miles to watch somebody burn. Listen to me. When you are set on fire for God and your life begins to change, people will come from miles. Why? Because it's not us. It's all him. God will do the same thing in your life. God will allow you to go through situations that seem impossible. You will look at situations in your life and think, this is an impossible situation. I don't even know what to do. And I want to tell you right now, what you feel may have set you back could just be a setup for something greater that God wants to do in your life. Don't miss the moments where God is saying, hey, 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 it's impossible with you. It's possible with me. The Bible says in Mark 10, 27, with man, these things are impossible, but... And I love that one conjunction, but with God, all things are possible. So once the completion of the building had come about, all of the people got together and they had a big celebration. They had a big memorial service. They had a big party, probably like we're going to do when this building is finished. And they all gathered around, and I I want to point out five things that they uh, surrendered themselves to. This was the response to everything that God had done. Remember, they had just come through 70 years of separation. They were, as a people, as a family, they were scattered out all across the land. So finally they had come to their moment of arrival where God had brought them back together. He was establishing them as a people again. And so they get together, and here's the first thing that happens. It's, in, it's found in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. It says, On October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the people, which included the men and women, the children, who, all who were old enough to understand. And he faced the the square just inside the water gate from, listen, from early morning until noon. And here's what he did. He read aloud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened to the reading of the book of the law. Or in other words, the Bible. They read the word of God for three hours, read the word. Now I want to bring something to your attention. As you come upon your moment of arrival as you draw closer to your purpose i want to tell you getting into god's word will completely change you because when you get into god's word it's it solidifies who he is it solidifies who he wants you to be it solidifies his purpose in your life um i can tell you personally when i when i gave my life to christ i just got into the word and i just started reading it and reading it and reading it. And I want to show you my Bible. There's actually one that's worse than that. The exact style Bible. This is the second or third. <laughs> this is from a, like a few years ago. This, the other one's duct taped together. Here's my point. I just buried my face in it. Because I realized, I, I want more than anything, I wanted to be who God had created me to be. Um, many of you in this place might be saying to yourself, my life doesn't make sense. You know, If you want your life to have purpose, if, 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 if you feel like maybe your, your life is just kind of crumbling and falling apart, all right, you need to have a Bible that's, that is. <laughs> you, you, if you want your life to, to, to make sense, your, your Bible needs to just look like a mess. And every page needs to be highlighted. Words need to be underlined. You need to make this your daily bread. So oftentimes, you know, you leave the house. And I know a lot of us go without breakfast. But imagine how much more energy and strength you'd have if you would eat something. Right? But we do it every day spiritually. We starve ourselves. And we expect to be able to step into the power and the purpose that God has for us. But we miss out so many times. We miss out on really walking in that power and that purpose because we just won't get in the word of God. Come on now. I'm talking to you today. Are you listening to what God is saying? I'm telling you right now. If you're one of those in this room that says, my life isn't falling apart, it's probably because your Bible is. It's good. Did you catch how long they prayed? I mean, how long they read the word? Three hours. 
three hours. Now catch what they did after they read the Word of God for three hours. you got to realize that the Word of God is not just an instruction manual. It's like soap. It's a cleansing agent for your life. When you begin to read the Word of God, you begin to align it with your life, and you begin to realize where you don't measure up. You see, a lot of times we compare ourselves on the outside to one another. We look at somebody else, and we're like, oh, I wish I looked like them, or I wish I was as good a shape as them, or I wish I had what they have. But listen, there's nobody we should compare ourselves to except for Jesus. And when you begin to read the Word of God, all of a sudden you begin to compare yourself to Him and realize we don't measure up, not the best of us. And so the second thing that they begin to do is this. They begin to commit themselves to live on fire for God by doing this one thing, and that was confessing their sins. Now understand, a lot of times when we, you know, we give an altar call or we give a salvation opportunity, we say, hey, do you want to invite Jesus into your heart? Forgive you of all your sins. Listen, it's not, confessing your sins is not just at the moment of salvation. It's not just something you do when you invite him in that first time. You see, every single day we should make confession a part of our life because the Bible says this, when you begin to study out what sin is, sin is this. Sin is anything that you say, anything that you think, or anything that you actually do that displeases God. Now, just pause for a second and do not look at anybody, okay? So you're saying we should confess like every hour? <laughs> no, probably, <laughs> because here's the thing. Sometimes you have this thought and you tell yourself, you're like, thank God I didn't say that. You know what I mean? Because I would have had to apologize. And I don't know about you, but I do not like to apologize. I do it when I have to. But, you know, here's what I want you to realize is that God even sees our thoughts. And he wants our thoughts to even line up with his word. So they begin for the next three hours. Guys, catch this. It says they remain standing for three hours while the book of the law is being read, while the Bible's being read. Then for three more hours, they were confessing their sin. Three hours worth of confession. And then you know what they did? They worshiped. Because you know what? They began to feel so pure. And they were like, God, we want nothing more than everything that you have for us. You see, it's not, we have to realize that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing wrong with us every single day saying, God, search my heart like King David did. Search my heart, Lord, and show me if there be any unclean ways in me. Because sometimes we don't even realize that there's things going on in our life that God is just shaking his head like a disappointed parent. And when you begin to pray that, he begins to just illuminate, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, I need to make that right. You know, even simple little things. Like the Bible says, do not grumble and complain. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. You know, in everything give thanks. And we're like, oh, it doesn't really mean that. You know what I'm saying? Nobody can do that. Hey. But we can do there. an altar call right now. These altars are open. That's right. Here we go. And I need to be the first one there. <laughs> I don't think there's enough room down here for everybody. <laughs> so it's, it's got to be a part of our daily life. That's what they did. All right. Number three, what did they commit themselves to? Prayer. Guys, when I, when I gave my life to Christ, when, when I began just really pouring everything out and drawing close to my purpose and trying to find alignment in my life, I realized that there was so much power in prayer, but not just any kind of prayer. A lot of times I think we're guilty of just going to God and saying, God, I, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. And Lord, can you do this while you're at it? And please do this. And we act like he's the candy man and we just give, or, or maybe it's, it's Santa's list at Christmas time. We say, I want you to do all these things, but that's not what relationship is all about. If all I did was told Misty what I wanted from her, but, there, but, but it wasn't coming from both directions. We wouldn't have much that would of a, not go over That wouldn't go well over too well. We wouldn't have much of a relationship. So it's, it's really about something more. And in this case, the people of Israel, this is so powerful. And if you'll apply it to your life, you'll never be the same again. They began, as they were praying, reminding God of who he was and what he had done in their lives as a people. Because remember, 70 years, they were separated from one another. And, and look what he did. He brought them all back together. He unified them. He strengthened them. He brought the resources. He brought the leadership. And he allowed them supernaturally to build that wall in, in 52 days. Right. So that wall is erected. And they're looking now at the, at the greatness of God. They're looking at everything that he had done. And they were saying, God, you are awesome. Look what you have done. Go, God. Imagine if we prayed like that. 
right? Imagine if we constantly, if you got up in the morning and said, God, man, look at you. Look at what you've done in my life. I can't wait to see what you're going to do today. Look at what you did yesterday. God, you're my provider. God, you're my healer. You're my source of strength. God, you're, you're my hope. You're my sure foundation. You're my rock, my fortress, my refuge. You're my everything, God. Imagine if we prayed like that. Because here's what it does. It reminds us. Not, uh, when we talk about who he is, it reminds us of what he can do. And it establishes our faith. It builds us up and helps us to move closer to our purpose. That's so good. And that's what Nehemiah was actually the one leading that prayer. He had been leading the whole team as they rebuilt the wall. And he began, I mean, honestly, you go, I encourage you to go read these. We can't read all of these passages in one setting. But if you read it, you'll begin to read his prayer. It's an entire chapter. And he starts from the beginning and he begins to remind the people of who God was. And as he began to do that, it says that they get through that prayer and then this is what they do. Number four, they commit themselves to realignment. They wanted to realign their lives because they realized that they had taken their own path over those past 70 years. Look at this. Chapter 9, verse 38, it says this. Then all the people responded in view of all of this. In view of what? In view of the fact of who God is and what God has done. In view of the fact that we have been confessing our sin. In view of the fact that we've read the word of God. And we're beginning to realize our life does not line up. We don't measure up to what God had for us. They said this. We are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. And then they begin to list all the names of the leaders first and then the families who are making a promise to say, we are going to obey God. Because they realized that in those 70 years, what led up to the exile was the fact that they had decided their plan was better than God's plan. And a lot of times we're guilty of this very same thing. We start having these thoughts in our mind and God, God downloads desires and dreams into our life. But sometimes we can get misaligned and we start heading off in a direction that God did not intend for us. And there's times in our life we want something so bad that we're willing to kick a door in to get to it when God was saying, I've been shutting that door. That wasn't what I wanted for you. And a lot of times it doesn't look the way like, like you think it ought to look. I promise you, if you came over to our office, we've kept every drawing that we did on what we thought Mountain Movers Church physical buildings were going to look like. None of them, none of them look like what they look like right now. Why? Because that was all in our mind. But as God began to open our eyes in the spirit, we began to see what he really wanted. And then it, this whole 42 thing blows our mind. As you go back and realize we didn't know what we were doing when we were laying out the plans for a 4,200 square foot building. It was all a part of his promise. But the people wanted to realign their lives. Number five. So here's what happens in our hearts. When we begin to pursue God's promises and his purpose for our life, and we begin to just really get into his word, like Misty said, we see ourselves differently. We line our lives with Christ, and he begins to change us and mold us, and he makes us uncomfortable, and, and we don't like change, and we fight it, and then we change a little bit, and we fight it, and we change a little bit. And then we learn how to, how to pray, and we, we learn how to realign ourselves. And, and this... this transformation process just begins to take place and when that happens we get a heart transplant yeah, right. we get a heart change and when that happens then our priorities change Here, here's how you know here's how you know that you're really stepping into your purpose and your relationship with god all your priorities begin to turn from looking inward to looking outward you, you reverse the curse. You, you, you stop asking how you can do these things for yourself, how you can benefit yourself. But you say, God, how can I benefit and bless others? How can I be a blessing to your kingdom? So the final thing that happened is they just begin to give like crazy, which is a heart change. I know you talk about money in church and people like grab their wallets and because they're like, no, -uh, not, not today. I, I'm telling you, th this is how you know. This is how you know that you're in right alignment with God is when you, your pocketbook is wide open. Your pocketbook is wide open to God because it's a heart condition. And so many people make the mistake of saying, I just get so sick and tired of what the church wants from me. That is such a lie. It's not even close to the truth. It's not what the church wants from you. It's what God wants for you. God wants you to realize that none of what you have belongs to you. He wants you to know that he is your soul, he is your soul source. 
your provider, your sustainer. And he wants to use you as conduit that he would flow through you in a mighty way so that he can be glorified in the, in the lives of others so that many, 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 many people can come to Christ. It's all about life change. And he wants to use you to change people's lives like crazy. That's why in this building project, you know, we've done these commitment cards. There's some on your seats. If you haven't made a commitment to this building project, I'm telling you, jump in. Jump in because you get to be a part of something that is so much bigger than you when you get in on this. Because at the end of the day, it's not about a building. It's about lives being changed. You know, you can look around this room and you can see so many lives that have actually changed. You're not the same people you used to be. And that's the exact reason that Jesus came. It's the reason that God sent his one and only son into this world was for life change. Because when we begin to have a real relationship with Jesus, not religion and not rituals, it changes us from the inside out. It's why God set us right here on this little piece of property to bring about hope and life change. And this morning, we want to share with you a story of a gentleman who attends Mountain Movers. He's been here just a few months. You may or may not have met him, but his story is going to bless you. It is one of complete and total life change. Check it out. My name is Scott Baker, and this is my story. We lived in a little town where I kind of got hung up with some delinquents and I started smoking at 13 and just made some bad decisions in my life growing up. In 93 my grandpa died and it really tore me down, took me to a bad place. And then in 01 my mother passed away while I was in Florida working a job and that was the hardest thing I'd ever had to deal with. I was in a relationship. We had three children together. Um, at one point, our children were taken away by DFS for unfortunate circumstances. At that point, I had lost my job. We didn't have fuel to get to court dates. We didn't have food to eat. So I had made the decision to write some bad checks. DFS and the court system terminated our rights and in my ex separated. At that point, I went into a depression where I ended up writing more checks. These checks were for cash, for food, just so I can survive. And my days were not very long. Um, they consisted of mostly sleeping. I couldn't bear to be in the world. I just, there was nights that I just prayed I didn't wake up. I drank an awful lot just to try to numb the pain and numb the feelings that I was having. I went to Florida to, to escape the familiarity and the hurt. I went to Florida for a few months to just try to get away and reset. When I came back from Florida and I just happened to be looking at Facebook Marketplace and I saw a man for a job. I called him, and uh, I went out and talked to him for a little bit. He hired me. And it was still kind of rough because I was living in my vehicle. He actually talked to me every day about God and got me more interested. I came to church with him one day. I came to church to Mountain Moors. Bruce and AJ had continuously invited me to church, religiously invited me to church. And I finally said yes. When I came in, I never felt more at home than I had anywhere else. There's such a feel of the Spirit here. And after that first day at church, I gave my life to Christ. I started reading. I started studying. Then I found out about life groups. And I signed up and it's... It's never been this good of a life for me. And from that point, I started feeling that there was actually hope for me again. It was such a dramatic life change. I went from being depressed all the time to smiling and happy and nothing can bring me down. After attending Mount Movers for six months, I was coming back from Springfield and I got pulled over. Um, 
I ended up having four warrants, past warrants, from the checks that I'd written. I uh, went to jail, I got a Bible, I read it every day, six, seven, eight hours a day sometimes. There was a gentleman that had come in that had wanted to die because he found out that he had bone cancer. From seeing me in my diligence and my faith, the last day before I got released, this gentleman decided to give his life to Christ and change his life forever. Even though all the bad had caught up with me, I was sitting in a jail cell feeling useless. It was his time to use me. My name is Scott Baker. I'm here to tell you that God is still in the business of moving mountains. Every decision we make has a consequence. God can take the bad decisions we make and turn them into good situations. What an incredible story. Yeah, give Scott a hand. You know, when I hear that story, I can't help but have tears running down my face. And so many that sit in this room, maybe you haven't shared your story publicly like Scott is willing to, but I know that there are those of you in this room who have felt the same hopelessness that Scott has. There may be some of you here today that you say, you know what, that's exactly where I'm at. And so often when we feel that hopeless feeling, we just want to numb it, as Scott said, with something that this world has to offer, whether it be alcohol or drugs or pills or whatever it is, relationships. But you know what, there's nothing that will ever fill the void. There's nothing. You don't just need to numb your pain. You need healing from your past. And that can only come through Jesus. And you see, that is the very reason, that is the purpose behind the promise throughout the entire word of God is that lives would be forever changed. You can't wipe the smile off Scott's face. If you see him in our foyers or outside, the dude is always smiling. And what's so incredible is that you don't realize when you walk up and you see these people and they're smiling, you think that, you know what, they can't possibly relate to where I am right now. They have no idea what's really going on in my life. But the fact is they can relate to where you've been because they've already walked through that junk and God's brought healing and God's brought real total life change. Now listen, there are consequences for our past. God doesn't say, hey, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll take your burden and I'll go do your jail time. That's not what he does. He says there's consequences for your past mistakes, but do you see what God did when God allowed him to have to go serve his time for the past bad decisions he made? God used it for his glory and he won another person. It was an inmate to the Lord. Come on, somebody. That's what it's all about. He had a contagious life change. And this morning, I want to encourage you to do exactly what the children of Israel did in their day, and that was complete and total surrender. I'm not talking about right now whether you've ever invited Jesus into your heart. I'm talking to everyone in this room. Those of us who have given our life to Jesus, there are times we get off just a little, and we need to realign. And the realignment comes when we begin to completely and totally surrender. God, whatever you want to do with my life, I'm yours. So this morning, I want to just encourage you to stand up. This worship team is going to lead you in a song that you may have heard before. It's an old, old song. Listen to these words as you just cry out to God, I surrender. Oh, to Jesus, I let this be your prayer. surrender.
right now that is praying that prayer of surrender, I want to just encourage you to say, God, search my heart. Show me if there be any unclean thing in me. Align my life with your purpose and your plan. If you're in this place today and you haven't been living a life that you feel like would be pleasing to God, you haven't truly surrendered your life to Jesus, you haven't made him the Lord of your life, you don't have a real relationship, and right now you are so ready for your life to change, then I want right now to just invite you to make Jesus the Lord of your life. I'm not going to promise you you won't have a problem after this fact, but I can promise you that God is going to walk right beside you as he begins to transform your life right before your eyes. So if you're here today and you say, I want to invite Jesus into my heart, I want to be forgiven of my sin, and I want to realign my life with his, I'm going to ask that you just put your hand in the air wherever you're at. No one's looking around. I see your hand. Anyone else? Today, you want to make that commitment. You want to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. I see your hand. Today, church, will you pray this prayer as we help these people make this commitment? Father God, thank you for giving your son to lay down his life so that I could live. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Align my life with your purpose and your plan. In Jesus' name, I pray. may be seated at this moment. I want to tell you today, if you just prayed that prayer, we want to celebrate the best decision you'll ever make by telling you we have a gift for you. It's called our Next Step Kit. If you're on campus, it's going to be at the left as you exit. If you're watching online, you can just direct message us and say, I'm all in. And we're going to send you a kit in the mail. But I want to tell you, we are all about helping you to see your life radically changed. And that's going to help tremendously. We've put your hands together this morning for all of those who just made that life-changing decision. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. Or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.